The Glass Castle, page 155 to 170. Seeing as how Welch was our new home, Brian and I figured we'd make the best of it. Dad had shown us the spot near the house where we were going to put the foundation and basement for the glass castle. He'd measured it off and marked it with stakes and string. Since Dad was hardly ever home, he was out making contacts and investigating the UMW, he told us, and never got around to breaking ground. Brian and I decided to help. We found a shovel and a pickaxe at an abandoned farm and just spent about every free minute digging a hole. We knew we had to dig it a big and deep. No point in building a good house unless you put down the right foundation, Dad always said. It was hard work, but after a month we dug a hole deep enough for us to disappear in. Even though we hadn't squared the edges or smoothed the floor, we were still pretty darn proud of ourselves. Once Dad had poured the foundation, we could help him put on the frame. But since we couldn't afford to pay the town's trash collection fee, our garbage was really piling up. One day, Dad told us to dump it in the hole. But that's for the glass castle, I said. It's a temporary measure, Dad told me. He explained that he was going to hire a truck to cart the garbage to the dump all at once, but he never got around to that either. And as Brian and I watched, the hole for the glass castle's foundation slowly filled with garbage. Around that time, probably because of all the garbage, a big nasty-looking river rat took up residence at 93 Little Hubbard Street. I first saw him in the sugar bowl. This rat was too big to fit into an ordinary sugar bowl, but since Mom had a powerful sweet tooth, Putting at least eight teaspoons of, in a cup of tea, we kept our sugar in a punch bowl on the kitchen table. This rat was not just eating the sugar, he was bathing in it, wallowing in it, positively luxuriating in it, his flickering tail hanging over the side of the bowl, flinging sugar across the table. When I saw him, I froze, then backed out of the kitchen. I told Brian, and we opened the kitchen door cautiously. The rat had climbed out of the sugar bowl and leaped up onto the stove. We could see his teeth marks on the pile of potatoes, our dinner, on a plate on the stove. Brian threw the cast iron skillet at the rat. It hit him and clanged on the floor, but instead of fleeing, the rat hissed at us as if we were the intruders. We ran out of the kitchen, slammed the door, and stuffed rags in the gap beneath it. That night, Maureen, who was five, was too terrified to sleep. She kept saying that the rat was coming to get her. She could hear it creeping nearer and nearer. I told her to stop being such a wuss. I really do hear the rat, she said. I think he's close to me. I told her she was letting fear get the best of her, and since this was one of those times that we had electricity, I turned on the light to prove it. There, crouched on Marine's lavender blanket, a few inches away from her face, was the rat. She screamed and pushed off her covers, and the rat jumped to the floor. I got a broom and tried to hit the rat with a handle, but it dodged me. Brian grabbed a baseball bat, and we maneuvered it, hissing and snapping into a corner. Our dog, Tinkle, the part Jack Russell Terrier who had followed Brian home one day, caught the rat in his jaws and banged it on the floor until it was dead. When Mom ran into the room, Tinkle was strutting around, all pumped up like the proud beast slayer that he was. Mom said she felt a little sorry for the rat. Rats need to eat, too, she pointed out. Even though it was dead, it deserved a name. She went on, so she christened it Rufus. Brian, who had read that primitive warriors placed the body parts of their victims on stakes to scare off their enemies, hung Rufus by the tail from a poplar tree in the front of our house the next morning. That afternoon, we heard the sound of gunshots. Mr. Freeman, who lived next door, had seen the rat hanging upside down. Rufus was so big, Mr. Freeman thought he was a possum, went and got his hunting rifle and blew him clean away. There is nothing left of Rufus but a mangled piece of tail. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. After the Rufus incident, I slept with a baseball bat in my bed. Brian slept with machete in his. Maureen could barely sleep at all. She kept dreaming that she was being eaten by rats, and she used every excuse she could to spend the night at a friend's house. Mom and Dad shrugged off the Rufus incident. They told us that we had done battle with fiercer adversaries in the past, and we would again someday. What are we going to do about the garbage pit? I asked. It's almost filled up. Enlarge it, Mom said. We can't keep dumping garbage out there, I said. What are people going to think? Life's too short to worry about what other people think, Mom said. Anyway, they should accept us for who we are. I was convinced that people might be more accepting of us if we made an effort to improve the way 93 Little Hubbard Street lurked. There were plenty of things we could do, I felt, that would cost almost nothing. Some people around Welch cut tires into two semicircles, painted them white, and used them as edging for their gardens. 
Maybe we couldn't afford to build the glass castle quite yet, but we certainly could put painted tires around our front yard to spruce it up. It would make us fit in a little bit, I pleaded with Mom. It sure would, Mom said. But when it came to Welch, she had no interest in fitting in. I'd rather have a yard filled with genuine garbage than with trashy lawn ornaments. I kept looking for other ways to make improvements. One day, Dad brought home a five-gallon can of house paint left over from some job he worked on. The next morning, I pried the can open. It was nearly full of bright yellow paint. Dad had brought some brushes home, too, and a layer of yellow paint, I realized, would completely transform our dingy gray house. It would look, at least from the outside, almost like the houses other people lived in. I was so excited by the prospect of living in a perky yellow home that I could barely sleep that night. I got up early the next day and tied my hair back, ready to begin the house painting. If we all work together, we can get it done in a day or two, I told everyone. But Dad said 93 Little Hubbard Street was such a dump that we shouldn't waste our time or energy on it that we could be devoting to the glass castle. Mom said she thought bright yellow houses were tacky. Brian and Lori said we didn't have the ladders or and scaffolding we needed. Dad was making no visible progress on the glass castle, and I knew that can of yellow paint would sit on the porch unless I undertook the job myself. I'd borrow a ladder and make one, I decided. I was certain that once everyone saw the amazing transformation of the house begin, they'd all join in. Out on the porch, I opened the can and stirred the paint with a stick, blending in the oil that had risen to the surface until the paint, which was the color of buttercups, had turned creamy. I dipped in a flat brush and spread the paint along the old clapboard siding in long, smooth strokes. It went on bright and glossy and looked even better than I had hoped. I started on the far side of the porch, around the door that went into the kitchen. In a few hours, I had covered everything that could be reached from the porch. Parts of the front were still unpainted, and so were the sides, but I had used less than a quarter of the paint. If everyone else helped, we could paint all the areas I couldn't reach, and in no time, we'd have a cheerful yellow house. But neither Mom, nor Dad, nor Brian, nor Lori, nor Maureen was impressed. So part of the front house is yellow now, Lori said. That's really going to turn things around for us. I was going to have to finish the job myself. I tried to make a ladder from bits of scrap wood, but it kept collapsing whenever I put my weight on it. I was still trying to build a sturdy ladder when, during a cold snap a few days later, my can of paint froze solid. When I got warm enough for the paint to thaw, I opened the can. During the freeze, the chemicals had separated, and the one smooth liquid was as lumpy and runny as curdled milk. I stirred it as hard as I could and kept stirring even after I knew the paint was ruined, because I also knew that we'd never get more, and instead of a freshly painted yellow house or even a dingy gray one, we now had a weird-looking ha half-finished patch job, one that announced to the world that the people inside the house wanted to fix it up but lacked the gumption to get the work done. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. Little Hubbard Street led up into those hollers so deep and narrow that people joked you had to pipe in the sunlight. The neighborhood did have lots of kids. Maureen had real friends for the first time, and we all tended to hang out at the National Guard Armory at the foot of the hill. The boys played tackle football on the training field. Most of the girls my age spent their afternoons sitting on the brick wall surrounding the armory, combing their hair and touching up their lip gloss, and pretending to get all indignant but secretly loving it if a crew-cut reservist wolf whistled at them. One of the girls, Cindy Thompson, made a special effort to befriend me. But it turned out that she really wanted was to recruit me for the junior Ku Klux Klan. Neither putting on makeup nor wearing a sheet had much appeal for me, so I played football with the boys, who would waive their guys' only rule and let me join a team if they were short a player. The better-off folk of Welch had not exactly flocked to our part of town. A few miners lived along the street, but most of the grown-ups didn't work at all. Some of the moms had no husbands, and some of the dads had black lung. The rest were either too distracted by their troubles or just plain unmotivated, so pretty much everyone grudgingly accepted some form of public aid. Although we were the poorest family on Little Hubbard Street, Mom and Dad never applied for welfare or food stamps, and they always refused charity. When teachers gave us bags of clothes from church drives, Mom made us take them back. We can take care of our own, Mom and Dad liked to say. We don't accept handouts from anyone. If things got tight, Mom kept reminding us that some of the other kids on Little Hubbard Street had it tougher than we did. The 12 greedy kids had no dad. 
he either died in a mine cave in or run off with a whore, depending on whom you listen to. And their mom spent her days in bed suffering from migraines. As a result, the Grady boys ran completely wild. It was hard to tell them apart because they all wore blue jeans and worn t-shirts and had their heads shaved bald to keep away lice. When the oldest boy found their dad's old pump-action shotgun under their mom's bed, he decided to get some target practice on Brian and me, firing buckshot at us as we ran for our lives through the woods. And then there were the Halls. All six of the Hall children had been born mentally retarded, and although they were now middle-aged, they all still lived at home with their mom and dad. When I was friendly to the oldest, Kenny Hall, who was 42, he developed a powerful crush on me. The other kids in the neighborhood teased Kenny by telling him that if he gave them a dollar or stripped down to his skivvies and showed them his wanker, they'd arrange for me to go on a date with him. On a Saturday night, if he'd been set up like that, he'd come and stand on the street in front of our house sobbing and hollering about me not keeping our date. And I'd have to go down and explain to him that the other kids had played a trick on him and that, although he did have many admirable qualities, I had a policy against dating older men. The family who had it toughest on Little Hubbard Street, I would have to say, was the pastors. The mother, Jenny Sue Pastor, was the town whore. Jenny Sue Pastor was 33 years old and had eight daughters and one son. Their names all ended with Y. Her husband, Clarence Pastor, had black lung and sat on the front porch of their huge, sagging house all day long. But he never smiled or waved at passers-by. Just sat there like he was frozen. Everyone in town said he'd been impotent for years, and none of the pastor kids was his. Jenny Sue Pastor pretty much kept to herself. At first, I wondered if she lay around in the lacy neige all day, smoking cigarettes and waiting for gentlemen callers. Back in Battle Mountain, the woman lounging on the front porch of the Green Lantern, I would long since figured out what they really did, wore white lipstick and black mascara and partially unbuttoned blouses that showed the tops of their brassieres. But Jenny Sue Pastor didn't look like a whore. She was a blousy woman with dyed yellow hair, and from time to time, we saw her out in the front yard, chopping wood or filling a scuttle from the coal pile. She usually wore the same kinds of aprons and canvas farm coats by the rest of the women on Little Hubbard Street. She looked like any other mom. I also wondered how she did her whoring with all those kids to look after. One night, I saw her car pull up in front of the pastor house and blink its headlights twice. After a minute, Jenny Sue came running out of the door and climbed into the front seat. Then the car drove off. Kathy was Jenny Sue Pastor's oldest daughter. The other kids treated her like a pariah, crowing that her mother was a whore and calling her lice girl. Truth was, she did have a pretty advanced case of head lice. She kept trying to befriend me. One afternoon on the way home from school, when I told her that we lived for a while in California, she lit up. She said her mama had always wanted to go there. She asked if maybe I'd come over to her place and tell her mama about life in California. Of course I went. I had never gotten inside the Green Lantern, but now I'd get up close look at the genuine prostitute. There were lots of things I wanted to know. Was whoring easy money? Was it ever any fun? Or was it just gross? Did Kathy and her sisters and her father all know Ginny Sue Pastor was a whore? What did they think of it? I didn't plan on flat out asking these questions. But I did think about getting inside the pastor's house and meeting Jenny Sue, so I'd come away with some idea of the answers. Clarence Pastor, sitting on the porch, ignored Kathy and me as we walked by. Inside, there were all these tiny rooms connected together like boxcars. Because of the way the house was settling on the eroding hillside, the floors and ceilings and windows tilted at different angles. There were no paintings on the walls, but the pastors had taped up pictures of smartly dressed women torn from Sears Roebuck catalogs. Kathy's little sister scampered around noisily, half-dressed. None of them looked alike. One was red-headed, one blonde, one had black hair, and they were all different shades of brown. Sweet man, the youngest, crawled along the living room floor, sucking on a fat dill pickle. Ginny Sue Pastor sat at the table in the kitchen. At her elbow was the carcass of a big, expensive rooster, the kind we could hardly ever afford. She had a tired, lined face, but her smile was cheerful and open. Pleased to meet you, she said, wiping her hands on her shirt tail. We ain't used to getting visitors. Jenny Sue offered us seats at the table. She had heavy breasts that swayed when she moved, and her blonde hair was dark as roots. You all helped me with this bird, and I'll fix you a couple of Jenny Sue's special chicken rolls. She turned to me. You know how to pick a chicken clean? I sure do, I said. I hadn't had anything to eat all day. 
Well, show me then, Jenny Sue said. I went for a wing first, pulling apart the spindly double bones and getting all the meat trapped there. Then I had to work on the leg and thigh bones, snapping them at the joints and peeling off the tenders and digging out the marrow. Kathy and Jenny Sue were also working on the bird, but soon they stopped to watch me. From the tail, I pulled the nice piece of meat that everybody misses. I turned the carcass upside down and scraped off the jellied fat and meat flecks with my fingernails. I stuck my arm elbow deep into the bird to excavate any meat clinging to the ribcage. Girl, Jenny Sue said, in all my days, I have never seen no one pick a chicken clean like you. I held up the spear-shaped cartilage in, a br in the breastbone, which most people don't eat, and bit down with a satisfying crunch. Jenny Sue scraped the meat into the bowl, mixed it with mayonnaise and cheese whiz, then crushed a handful of potato chips and added them. She spread the mixture onto two slices of Wonder Bread, then rolled each slice into a cylinder and passed them to us. Birds in a blanket, she said. They tasted great. Mama, Jeanette lived in California, Kathy said. That's so, Jenny Sue said. Live in California and be a stewardess. That was my dream. She sighed. Never got beyond Bluefield. I told her and Kathy about life in California. It quickly became clear that they had no interest in desert mining towns, so I told them about San Francisco and then about Las Vegas, which wasn't exactly in California, but they didn't seem to care. I made the days we had spent there seem like years, and the showgirls I had seen from a distance seemed like close friends and neighbors. I described the glittering casinos and the glamorous high rollers, the palm trees and the swimming pools, the hotels with ice-cold air conditioning, and the restaurants where the hostesses with long white gloves lit flaming desserts. It don't get no better than that, Jenny Sue said. No, ma'am, it sure don't, I told her. Sweet man came in crying, and Jenny Sue picked him up and let him suck the mayonnaise off her finger. You did good on that bird, Jenny Sue told me. You strike me as the kind of girl who's one day going to be eating roast chicken and those on-fire desserts just as much as you want, she winked. It was only on the way home that I realized I hadn't gotten answers to any of my questions. While I was sitting there talking to Jenny Sue, I'd forgotten that she was a whore. One thing about whoring, it put chicken on the table. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. We fought a lot in Welch, not just to fend off our enemies, but to fit in. Maybe it was because there was so little to do in Welch. Maybe it was because their life was so hard and it made people hard. Maybe it was because of all the bloody battles over unionizing the mines. Maybe it was because mining was dangerous and cramped and dirty work and it put all the miners in bad moods and they came home and took it out on their wives who took it out on their kids who took it out on other kids. Whatever the reason, it seemed that just about everyone in Welch, men, women, boys, girls, liked to fight. There were street brawls, bar stabbings, parking lot beatings, wife slappings, and toddler wailings. Sometimes it was simply a matter of someone throwing a stray punch, and it would be all over before you knew it had started. Other times, it would be more like a 12 roundup prize fight with spectators cheering on the bloody, sweating opponents. Then there were the grudges and feuds that went on for years, a couple of brothers beating up some guy because back in the 50s his father had beaten up their father, a woman shooting her best friend for sleeping with her husband, and the best friend's brother then stabbing the husband. You'd walk down McDowell Street and half the people you passed seemed to be nursing an injury sustained from local combat. There were shiners, split lips, swollen cheekbones, bruised arms, scraped knuckles, and bitten earlobes. We had lived in some pretty scrappy places back in the desert, but Mom said Welch was the fightingest town she'd ever seen. Brian and Lori and Maureen and I got into more fights than most kids. Danita Hewitt and her friends were only the first in a whole line of little gangs who did battle with one or more of us. Other kids wanted to fight us because we had red hair, because Dad was a drunk, because we wore rags and didn't take many baths as we should have, because we lived in a falling down house that was partially painted yellow and had a pit filled with garbage because they go by our dark house at night and could see that we couldn't even afford electricity. But we always fought back, usually as a team. Our most spectacular fight and our most audacious tactical victory, the Battle of Little Hubbard Street, took place against Ernie Goad and his friends when I was 10 and Brian was 9. Ernie Goad was a pug-nosed, thick-necked kid who had little eyes set practically on the sides of his head like a whale. He acted as if it was his sworn mission to drive the Walls family out of town. It started one day when I was playing with some other kids on the tank parked next to the armory. 
Ernie Goad appeared and began throwing rocks at me and yelling at the Walls's should all leave Welch because we were stinking it up so bad. I threw a couple of rocks back and told him to leave me alone. Make me, Ernie said. I don't make garbage, I shouted. I burn it. This was usually a foolproof comeback, making up in scorn what it lacked in originality, but on this occasion it backfired. Y'all wazes don't burn garbage, Ernie yelled back. Y'all throw it in the hole next to your house. You live in it. I tried to think of a comeback to his comeback, but my mind seized up because what Ernie said was true. We did live in garbage. Ernie stuck his face in mine. Garbage! You live in garbage! Cause you are garbage! I shoved him good and hard, then turned to the other kids, hoping for backup, but they were easing away and looking down, as if they were ashamed to have been caught playing with a girl who had a garbage pit next to her house. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. That Saturday, Brian and I were reading on the sofa when one of the window panes shattered and a rock landed on the floor. We ran to the door. Ernie and three of his friends were pedaling their bikes up and down Little Hubbard Street, whooping madly, garbage, garbage, y'all are a bunch of garbage. Brian went out on the porch. One of the kids hurled another rock that hit Brian in the head. He staggered back, then ran down the steps, but Ernie and his friends pedaled away, shrieking. Brian came back up the stairs, blood trickling down his cheek and onto his t-shirt, and a pump knot already swelling up above his eyebrow. Ernie's gang returned a few minutes later, throwing stones and shouting that they had actually seen the pigsty where the Walls kids lived, and that they were going to tell the whole school it was even worse than everyone said. This time, both Brian and I chased after them. Even though they outnumbered us, they were enjoying the game of taunting us too much to make a stand. They rode down the first switchback and got away. They'll be back, Brian said. What are we going to do? I asked. Brian sat thinking. Then he told me he had a plan. He found some rope under the house and led me to the clearing on the hillside above Little Hubbard Street. A few weeks earlier, Brian and I had dragged an old mattress up there because we were thinking of camping out. Brian explained how we could make a catapult, like the medieval ones we'd read about, by piling rocks on the mattress and rigging it with ropes looped over tree branches. We quickly assembled the contraption and tested it once, jerking back on the ropes at the count of three. It worked. A minor avalanche of rocks rained onto the street below. It was, we were convinced, enough to kill Ernie Goad and his gang, which was what we fully intended to do. Kill them and commandeer their bikes, leaving their bodies in the street as a warning to others. We piled the rocks back on the mattress, re-rigged the catapult, and waited. After a couple of minutes, Ernie and his gang reappeared at the switchback. Each of them rode one-handed and carried an egg-sized rock in his throwing hand. They were proceeding single file, like a Pawnee war party, a few feet apart. We couldn't get them all at once, so we aimed for Ernie, who was at the head of the pack. When he came within range, Brian gave the word, and we jerked back on the ropes. The mattress shot forward, and our arsenal of rocks flew through the air. I heard them thud against Ernie's body and clatter to the road. He screamed and cursed as his bike skidded. The kid behind Ernie ran into him, and they both fell. The other two turned around and sped off. Brian and I started hurling whatever rocks were at hand. Since they were downhill, we had a good line of fire and scored several direct hits, the rocks stinging off their bikes, nicking the paint, and denting the fenders. Then Brian yelled, Charge! And we came barreling down the hill. Ernie and his friends jumped back on their bikes and furiously pedaled off before we could reach them. As they disappeared around the bend, Brian and I did a victory dance on the rock-strewn street, giving our own war whoops. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. As the weather warmed, a sort of rough beauty overtook the steep hillsides around Little Hubbard Street. Jack in the pulpits and bleeding hearts sprouted wild. White Queen Anne's lace and purple phlox and big orange daylilies blossomed along the road. During the winter, you could see abandoned cars and refrigerators and the shells of deserted houses in the woods. But in the spring, the vines and weeds and moss grew over them, and in no time they disappeared altogether. One benefit of summer was that each day we had more light to read by. Mom really piled up on the books. She came home from the Welch Public Library every week or two with a pillowcase full of novels, biographies, and histories. She snuggled into bed with them, looking up from time to time, saying she was sorry. She knew she should be doing something more productive, but like Dad, she had her addictions, and one of them was reading. 
We all read, but I never had the feeling of togetherness I had in Battle Mountain when we all sat around in the depot with our books. In Welch, people drifted off into different corners of the house. Once night came, we kids all lay on our rope and cardboard beds, reading by flashlight or candle we'd set on our wooden boxes, each of us creating our own little pool of dim light. Lori was the most obsessive reader. Fantasy and fiction dazzled her, especially The Lord of the Rings. When she wasn't reading, she was drawing orcs or hobbits. She tried to get everyone in the family to read the book. They transport you to a different world, she'd say. I didn't want to be transported to another world. My favorite books all involved people dealing with hardships. I loved The Grapes of Wrath, Lord of the Flies, and especially A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. I thought Francie Nolan and I were practically identical, except that she lived 50 years earlier in Brooklyn and her mother always kept the house clean. Francie Nolan's father sure reminded me of dad. If Francie saw the good in her father, even though most people considered him a shiftless drunk, maybe I wasn't a complete fool for believing in mine or trying to believe in him. It was getting harder. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. One night that summer, when I was lying in bed and everyone else was asleep, I heard the front door open and the sound of someone muttering and stumbling around in the darkness. Dad had come home. I went into the living room, where he was sitting on a drafting table. I could see by the moonlight coming through the window that his face and hair were matted with blood. I asked him what had happened. I got in a fight with a mountain, he said, and the mountain won. I looked at Mom asleep on the sofa bed, her head buried under a pillow. She was a deep sleeper and hadn't stirred. When I lit the kerosene lamp, I saw that Dad also had a big gash in his right forearm and a cut on his head so deep that I could see the white of his skull. I got a toothpick and tweezers and picked the rocky grit out of the gash. Dad didn't wince when I poured rubbing alcohol on the wound. Because of all of his hair, I had no way to put on a bandage, and I told Dad I should shave the area around the cut. Hell, honey, that would ruin my image, he said. A fellow in my position's got to look presentable. Dad studied the gash on his forearm. He tightened the tourniquet around his upper arm and told me to fetch Mom's sewing box. He fumbled around in it for silk thread, but unable to find any, decided that cotton would be fine. He threaded a needle with black thread, handed it to me, and pointed at the gash. Sew it up, he said. Dad, I can't do that. Oh, go ahead, honey, he said. I'd do it myself, except I can't do diddly with my left hand, he smiled. Don't worry about me. I'm so thoroughly pickled I won't feel a thing. Dad lit a cigarette and placed his arm on the table. Go ahead, he said. I pressed the needle up against Dad's skin and shuddered. Go ahead, he said again. I pushed the needle and felt a slight tug when it pierced the skin. I wanted to close my eyes, but I needed to see. I pushed a little harder and felt the resistance of Dad's flesh. It was like sewing meat. It was sewing meat. I can't, Dad. I'm sorry. I just can't do it, I said. We'll do it together, Dad said. Using his left hand, he guided my fingers as they pushed the needle all the way in through his skin and out the other side. A few droplets of blood appeared. I pulled the needle out and gave the thread a gentle jerk to tighten it. I tied the two ends of the thread together like Dad told me to, and then, to put it in a second stitch, I did it again. The gash was pretty big and could have used a few more stitches, but I couldn't bring myself to stick that needle in Dad's arm one more time. We both looked at the two dark, slightly sloppy stitches. That's some fine handiwork, Dad said. I'm mighty proud of you, Mountain Goat. When I left the house the next morning, Dad was still asleep. When I came home in the evening, he was gone. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide.